Hi everyone, and welcome back to my course on Lagrangian mean curvature flow, in particular cohomogeneity 1 Lagrangian mean curvature flow. And in this lecture, we want to get to the point where we understand what is meant by cohomogeneity 1. So to do that, we need to understand the terminology of group actions. So I will try to go through this nice and quickly so we can get to the good stuff. So we have a Lie group G, a smooth manifold M bar, and a left action of G on M bar, which will either be denoted LP, which is a function from G to M bar, the action of G at that point P, or it will be denoted just G dot P. Um, we recall that the adjoint action is an action of our group on its own Lie algebra, and that's essentially given by conjugation. If we conjugate the whole group by an element little g, so little g, capital G, little g inverse, um, then that will keep the identity uh, fixed. So the derivative of that function will be an endomorphism of the tangent space at the identity, which is, of course, the Lie algebra. So that's the adjoint action, and that action induces an action also on the dual space, um, given by this formula here, where the angle brackets are the dual pairing of the Lie algebra with its dual. Okay, back to the action of G on M bar. If we have some point P in M bar, then we denote the orbit by OP, the stabilizer by HP, so the set of points in the set of elements in G that fix P. That's also known as the isotropy group. And we also need the notion of the infinitesimal action. So we essentially take the derivative of this function up here, LP which will then be a function from the tangent space of G to the tangent space of M bar. And if we consider that derivative at the identity, then this will be a function from the tangent space of capital G at the identity, which is the Lie algebra, to the tangent space of M bar at P. Um, we define the infinitesimal action at P to be the negative of this derivative. And we define it to be the negative, it's essentially an arbitrary choice, but that will uh, give us a slightly nicer property in uh, about 30 seconds time. Um, a more concrete definition of the infinitesimal action is that the action applied to a Lie algebra element x is what you get if you exponentiate that element multiplied by a, a parameter t, a real parameter t, apply that group element to the point p, so that will move p, and differentiate that at t equals zero. So you can really feel from this definition that it is sort of the momentum of the point P when being pushed uh, in the direction of the, uh, of the Lie algebra element X. Um, so here's an example. If you look on the left-hand side, this is an action of U1. So U1 is in red down here uh, on C, just by rotating around the origin. The point P has this orbit in green and the Lie algebra is this orange line, the tangent space to U1 at the identity, which is just I times the real way. And the, if you take an element X in this Lie algebra, then that exponentiates to some point on the group. And if you multiply that group element by P, it will move it in this direction. So if we differentiate, um, differentiate a one parameter family, uh, Tx, then it stands to reason that what you should get is the tangent vector at p pointing along the orbit. So from this, uh, from this example, we get the intuition that the image of the infinitesimal action should be the tangent space of the orbit. It's also true that the kernel is the Lie algebra of the stabilizer, which also makes sense, because if we take an element of the stabilizer, if we take an element of the Lie algebra of the stabilizer, and exponentiate it, then we get a genuine element of the stabilizer, which fixes P. So if we use this uh, definition here of the infinitesimal action, this uh, right-hand side will, of course, just be the constant element P, and the derivative of that will be zero. So an element of the Lie algebra of the stabilizer of P will be in the kernel of the infinitesimal action. Um, second property that the infinitesimal action satisfies is that it's a Lie algebra homomorphism. If we chose the opposite sign convention when defining the infinitesimal action, then this would be a Lie algebra anti-homomorphism, and I personally prefer this choice, although many authors choose the other way around, which can get a little bit frustrating. 
And uh, finally, we have an equivariance property. So uh, if we apply the adjoint action to a Lie algebra element x and then the infinitesimal action, what we get is the same thing as if we first apply the infinitesimal action and then apply the push forward of the uh, Lie group action. And one final piece of terminology. We say that stabilizer groups HP and HQ have the same isotropy type uh, denoted with these brackets if there exists some group element little g and g such that conjugating the stabilizer group HP by g gives you the stabilizer group HQ. And the reason that this is an important concept is that if you have two points P and Q in the same orbit as in this diagram here uh, and P has stabilizer HP then the stabilizer of Q can quickly be seen, the stabilizer of Q defined to be G uh, acting on P can easily be seen to be G HP G inverse. So although it's not the case that points in the same orbit have the same stabilizer, it is true that points in the same orbit have the same isotropy type or stabilizer type. Okay. Let's move on to the implications for Lagrangians. Uh, so we can't just have any group actions. We need group actions that preserve all our structures. So the setup now is that we have a Kähler manifold with the Riemannian almost complex and uh, Kähler structures. We have a Lie group G, and we will have an action of G on M bar. But we will require that this action is Kähler meaning that it preserves all three of those structures, it preserves the metric, it preserves the almost complex structure, and it preserves the symplectic form. And we also will ask that it's Hamiltonian. And what that means is that there exists a map known as the moment map, which essentially acts as a primitive for the infinitesimal action. Um, in the following sense, the exterior derivative applied to the moment map paired with a Lie algebra element x is equal to the interior product of the infinitesimal action of x with the symplectic form. So you can see here that this is essentially saying that the derivative of mu is the infinitesimal action of x up to some isomorphisms. Um, we also ask that the moment map plays nicely with the group action in the sense that it is equivariant with respect to the left action on M and the co-adjoint action on the dual of the Lie algebra. Note that the moment map maps from the manifold M bar to the dual of the Lie algebra. So uh, it makes sense that the equivariance should be stated in terms of the co-adjoint action here. Okay, so one example, an easy example of a moment map is if we have a primitive lambda for the symplectic form omega, uh, i.e. d lambda equals omega, such that it is invariant under the group action. So the pullback with respect to the left action of g uh, of lambda is just lambda for all g. In that case, the Louisville form combined with the infinitesimal action gives us a moment map. And you can sort of see how this should work. If you take the exterior derivative of this mu here, you can see how uh, the Louisville form should become the, the symplectic form, and you'll end up with this equation up here. And the equivariance will come from the fact that we ask our primitive to be G invariant. So from now on, we assume that we have exactly that setup. We assume that we have a Kähler manifold, we assume that we have a left G action, and we assume that that G action is Hamiltonian Kähler. Then our question is, what can we say about G invariant Lagrangians? Well, surprisingly, we can say quite a lot, and that is encapsulated in this proposition here. So uh, for that, we need one more piece of terminology. We say that an element of the dual of the Lie algebra is central, if it is preserved by the co-adjoint action. In other words, for all G and G, the co-adjoint action of G on, on Xi is equal to Xi. Then, if we have that setup and an immersed Lagrangian L in M bar, then if L is G invariant, 
it turns out that there must exist a central value of the dual of the Lie algebra such that L is contained in the level set of the moment map at that value. The ramifications of this are quite large because it means that if we have a G invariant Lagrangian, then it necessarily has to lie in essentially a submanifold of our, of our ambient space. And if that submanifold happens to be of quite low dimension, then we've essentially reduced the dimension of our ambient space. And this is important because the study of high co-dimension mean curvature flow is much trickier than the study of, say, hypersurface mean curvature flow. Much is known about the soliton solutions and singularities of hypersurface mean curvature flow, and much less is known in the general co-dimension case. That's one of the things that makes Lagrangian mean curvature flow quite tricky to study. So if it turned out, for example, that this, uh, this mu inverse of xi, this level set, happened to be of reasonably low dimension relative to the Lagrangian, then this should make the study of the flow much easier. So before we explore the full ramifications, let's go through the proof, because I consider this to be perhaps the most, the most important fact for this subject. So let's fix a point P in L and consider the orbit O of P, as in this diagram here. So if we take some uh, V in the tangent space of M at P and some element of the Lie algebra X, then we can go through a series of equalities. So the pairing of d mu of v with x by the definition of a moment map is the same as omega applied to v and the infinitesimal action at x. And now using the Kähler identities, not sorry, not the Kähler identities, but just the uh, compatibility of uh, the metric, the almost calibrated structure, the almost complex structure, and the symplectic form, this is the same as minus v in a product j rho of x. And what this tells us is that v is in the kernel of d mu if and only if v is orthogonal to j rho of x for all x in the Lie algebra. And this tells us that the kernel of d mu at p is the same thing as the normal space to j of the tangent space of the orbit since the image of the infinitesimal action is the tangent space of the orbit. Now, since our L is G invariant, that tells us that the orbit is contained in L. And that tells us that the tangent space of the orbit is contained in the tangent space of L, which tells us that the J of the tangent space of the orbit is contained in J of the tangent space of L, which is the same as the normal space of the Lagrangian by the definition of a Lagrangian submanifold. And so taking normals of this equation, we must have that the tangent space of L is the same as the normal space, the perpendicular subspace of, the, of J of the tangent space of L, which is equal to the, sorry, this should be the tangent space of OP here, of course just uh, taking the perpendicular complement of the previous uh, inequality. Um, and therefore, by this first equality up here, this is equal to the kernel of d mu. So in other words, the kernel of d mu is the same as the tangent space of the Lagrangian. Now, since L is connected, mu therefore must be constant on L. If the kernel of d mu is... The, is uh, so if the tangent space of the Lagrangian is contained in the kernel of d mu, then if we take any path along the surface of L and ask how is mu changing, um, then the answer is that it's not, um, because d mu applied to the tangent vector of that curve is equal to zero. So therefore mu is constant on L, since we can draw a path from any point on L to any other point on L. Um, and therefore, there must exist some element of uh, the dual of the Lie algebra with L contained in the level set at that value. So the other claim was that this value had to be central. So let's check that. So since mu is constant on L, that implies that mu applied to g dot z 
is equal to mu of z for, for any point z. Um, and in particular, using the equivariance of the moment map, we can pull the g outside and the co-adjoint action applied to mu of z has to equal mu of z. Um, but that means that mu of z is preserved by the co-adjoint action, which is exactly what it means for mu of z to be central and uh, mu of z is equal to psi no matter which point z we choose, since mu is constant on L. Right, so uh, let's explore the ramifications of this proposition. So ideally, we've reduced the co-dimension of our Lagrangian, but the obvious first question to ask is, is mu inverse of psi even a submanifold? It's, uh, if you um, have a particular moment map in mind, maybe you could say it's a, a real algebraic variety or something like that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a smooth submanifold. If it is a smooth manifold, then what's its dimension? That's very important. And lastly, the ideal um, conclusion of this would be not just that we have L contained in some lower dimensional submanifold, but that we can take the quotient of L and that submanifold to reduce the dimension as well as the co-dimension. Um, so if we did this, is that smooth? So in order to answer this question, let's examine the example that we looked at last time and see what this situation looks like in that case. So if you remember, last time we discussed a notion of SON invariant Lagrangians, which was defined in terms of a smooth immersed curve gamma and this immersion F that has as its domain R times SN minus one and is defined in terms of gamma and a parameter on the sphere. And um, if we match this up with all of the group action theory. Our group in this case is SON, it's acting on CN. Uh, the Lie algebra is frac SON, and this is indeed a Kähler action. Um, there is an inner product on the Lie algebra given by minus trace XY for Lie algebra elements X and Y, and this is useful because it means that we can write everything in terms of the Lie algebra rather than the dual of the Lie algebra, which can be helpful and easier to think about. So the standard moment map for this action is given by uh, give, given in terms of the Lie algebra rather than the dual of the Lie algebra. So I'll write mu sharp, and it's defined to be minus a half projection to the Lie algebra of i z z bar t, where this projection is in terms of this inner product here. So you can actually calculate that and you get this explicit form here. So this is the moment map. So what are the central values? Well, it turns out that for this particular group, the only central value is zero. And so the proposition tells us that the any G invariant Lagrangian has to live in a level set of the moment map at a central value. But if the only central value is zero, then therefore any G invariant Lagrangian must live in the zero level set of the moment map. So we can figure out what that is using this explicit form of the moment map. And it turns out that it is um, the subset C applied to Sn minus 1, where Sn minus 1 is viewed as being a subset of Rn inside Ca. But this is exactly the subset that we were restricted to before. If you remember, we noted that the SON invariant Lagrangians, um, by this definition, were necessarily restricted to lie in precisely this subset, which turns out now to be the level set of the moment map at zero. So we thought maybe at the time that this was uh, an imperfect definition of an SON invariant Lagrangian submanifold, and it was missing out a lot of possibilities. But actually, our proposition tells us that Lagrangian submanifolds of that form using uh, using that immersion are the only possible SON invariant submanifolds since they all have to lie in this subset. So yes, the above SON invariant examples are the only ones. Um, thinking about the isotropy types, there are only two contained in mu inverse of zero. The origin itself has isotropy type SON because of course SON stabilizes 
the origin. Every element of the group stabilizes the origin. And the rest of mu inverse of zero uh, has isotropy type SON minus one. Essentially, it's the stabilizer of the north pole of the sphere SN minus one. Okay, before we move on from looking at examples, I'd like to just cover one more. Um, so more generally, in fact, if we have some group in UN, then the induced action on CN is going to be Kähler because of the fact that UN is a subgroup of uh, O2N, which is the set of matrices that preserve the metric. It's a subgroup of GLNC, which is the set of matrices which preserve the complex structure and sp2nr which is the set of matrices that, matrices that preserve the symplectic form so uh, any subgroup of un the induced action on cn is going to preserve all these structures and therefore be a kähler action son is one example of such a group but another one is tn minus one which is an abelian group given by the uh, diagonal matrices of unit complex numbers e to the i theta 1 up down to e to the i theta n such that theta 1 uh, sum up to theta n is equal to 0 mod 2 pi. Um, so again, these, uh, this is not a new group to consider uh, and they've been studied before, for example, by Harvey Lawson and by Joyce who give examples of special Lagrangians and special Lagrangian cones in CN with this symmetry group. Uh, so let's tackle it from our, using our language. So our group is TN minus one, the, the Lie algebra, I'm just gonna call frac TN minus one, but it's just essentially a R, R, N minus one. And the moment map has the same form as the moment map of the SON action. That's because actually, if you have any group, any subgroup of UN, then uh, the moment map for the UN action is just minus a half I, Z, Z bar T, and projecting this matrix to the uh, Lie subalgebra of frac u n gives a moment map for the uh, for the g action. So in this case, we just take this matrix and we project to frac t n minus one. And again, we can write this explicitly uh, in terms of the coordinates on c n. The difference between this example and the S O N example is in the S O N example there was only one central element because it was a semi-simple group. But this is an abelian group. Uh, and therefore, the adjoint action of Tn minus 1 on its own Lie algebra is trivial. And therefore, all elements are central. So whereas previously we concluded that all SON invariant Lagrangians had to lie in a single level set of the moment map, here we have a situation where the all of the level sets of this moment map admit Tn minus one invariant Lagrangians. So it's no longer true that a Tn minus one invariant Lagrangian must lie in mu inverse of zero, for example. Um, nevertheless, we can still look at mu inverse of zero and, and we notice that there are some similarities to the SON case. So mu inverse of zero is the, uh, can be seen to be the set of complex numbers such that all of the coordinates have the same size. And so this is just the, the, C, the, the Tn minus one orbit of the plane given by the C orbit of the point one, 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 et cetera. So this is exactly the same form as we had before. If you remember in the SON example, we had a plane given by the C orbit of one, zero, zero, et cetera. And then it was the SON orbit of that gave mu inverse of zero. And here we have a different plane uh, and the Tn minus one orbit of that gives mu inverse of zero. Um, this will be important uh, in the theory to come. Um, before we move back to the theory, uh, I'd like to give this uh, example um, no, known now as the Harvey Lawson TN minus one cone. It's an example of a special Lagrangian cone. Um, and this is uh, a TN minus one invariant cone. Um, and this admits a smooth special Lagrangian smoothing, or, or rather if you have two of these cones, uh, with a particular angle between them, then it admits a smooth special Lagrangian smoothing. Um, analogous to how if you have two intersecting uh, Lagrangian, special Lagrangian planes, um, then given an angle condition, that can be smoothed into a Lawler neck. Okay, so let's go back and talk about our question. So we asked, is it the case that mu inverse of xi is necessarily a submanifold? 
uh, for some value psi in the, the dual of the Lie algebra? And what is its dimension? The answer to this first question is no. As we've seen, even in the basic case of mu inverse of zero for SON acting on CN, mu inverse of zero was not a submanifold, it was actually a cone, and it included that sort of singular point at the origin. Um, so the way to fix this is to restrict to a particular isotropy type. So if we remember in the SON case, although it was the case that mu inverse of zero was not a manifold, if we remove the, the singular orbit at the origin, then the remainder is a smooth submanifold of CN. Um, so that suggests that we restrict our attention to one particular isotropy type and just work there. Um, and this works and leads to the following version, quite general version of Kähler reduction, which is the theory of taking quotients of level sets of moment maps uh, of Hamiltonian actions on Kähler manifolds. So we fix a central value psi in the dual of the algebra, and we also fix an isotropy type H. Um, and if we fix an isotropy type, then the, the points that belong to that isotropy type, the points such that the stabilizer under the G action have stabilizer conjugate to H, and the orbits of those points are necessarily going to be diffeomorphic to G quotient H, um, and therefore they're always going to be the same dimension no matter what the stabilizer is. Um, so these G orbits we're going to say are N minus K dimensional. And now we fix a connected component of this set here, M psi, which I define to be the level set of the moment map at psi intersect the set of points in our ambient manifold M bar with isotropy type H, which I denote M bar subscript H. So here are the conclusions. Firstly, M is a smooth manifold and it is G invariant. So the quotient is also a smooth manifold, which we will call Q. It's a fact that the manifold M is N plus K dimensional, and the quotient is therefore going to be 2K dimensional. Secondly, Q is not just a smooth manifold, it's actually a Kähler manifold. So it admits a Kähler structure that is in some sense compatible with the Kähler structure of, of M bar. Uh, and I'm not going to go through these three conditions uh, because it's not actually too relevant for us. Uh, but if you're interested, you can pause the video and have a look at these three, uh, three compatibility conditions. More importantly for us is the fact that this quotient induces a bijection between G invariant immersed Lagrangians in our submanifold M, uh, which remember is our connected component of this part of this level set with isotropy type H. So there's a bijection between those, the G invariant Lagrangians in M, and immersed Lagrangians in the quotient of M, Q. So in other words, we, the theory of G invariant immersed Lagrangians may be reduced to the theory of just Lagrangians in a lower dimensional space. So uh, here's a picture. So M bar is the ambient space here. Mu inverse of psi, I'm drawing as this sort of cony thing, imitating our picture of mu inverse of zero in those examples that we looked at. And then you see I've circled this sort of bad orbit in the center, which in our examples was the origin. So what we're doing really is we're removing the bad orbit. Maybe there are other bad orbits as well in, in, in general. So we're removing uh, bad orbits, leaving us with just a single isotropy type H, uh, and that's a smooth manifold that we call M. Well, actually, we call it M psi, and we focus on one particular connected component. And then we take a quotient of that and get this Q down in the base. And then I'm pointing out here uh, an example of a Lagrangian in green that descends to a Lagrangian in the quotient space here in light green. Uh, I just want to quickly comment, the reason we fix a connected component is because if we don't do that, then we might actually have that this M psi has components of different dimensions. So then it wouldn't strictly be a manifold uh, by the normal definition. Instead, it's the case that the connected components are manifolds. 
Um, and similarly, the quotient, if we took a quotient of the whole of m xi, the quotient would be a union of manifolds, possibly of different dimensions. So the language is simpler if we just focus on one connected component. Okay, so what has happened here? Well, um, we've managed to reduce the complexity of, of our study of G-invariant Lagrangians quite considerably. Previously, G-invariant Lagrangians were n-dimensional inside this 2n-dimensional ambient space. Um, but now we've reduced the dimension and the co-dimension, because now, uh, by applying Kähler reduction, we're working with k-dimensional Lagrangians inside a 2k-dimensional ambient space. And there's a slight mistake here. That picture, Q, should be 2k-dimensional. So um, you might immediately realize that if it's the case that the G orbits um, with, with this isotropy type are n minus k dimensional for k equals n minus 1, sorry, for k equals 1, I mean, so the orbits are n minus 1 dimensional, then the quotient space is going to be two dimensional and our Lagrangians are just going to be curves. So that's a particularly easy thing to understand. Indeed, curve shortening flow is essentially completely understood. We understand all the soliton solutions, we understand all the singularities. Um, it's a, essentially a completed theory. So uh, studying the case where the G orbits are n minus one dimensional, studying the, uh, the studying G invariant Lagrangians is equivalent to studying some curves in a two manifold. So finally, I'd like to talk about how this theory affects the study of Lagrangian mean curvature flow. So for that, we need to work in a Calabi Yau manifold. So we don't just have our metric, almost complex structure and Kähler form, but we also have a holomorphic volume form, capital omega. And now we have some action of G, a Kähler, Hamiltonian Kähler action of G on, on this M bar. Our big question is, does a G invariant Lagrangian mean curvature flow stay in the same level set of the moment map? So we know that any Lagrangian has to lie in a particular level set of the moment map, allowing us to study it via the quotient in the, in the Kähler quotient. But in order for us to be able to use that Kähler quotient to study Lagrangian mean curvature flow, we have to ensure that our Lagrangian stays in the same level set, uh, mu inverse of xi in, in our calabi manifold M bar. So is that the case? Does that happen? Well, there is this lemma of Kono uh, that says that there exists a unique element of the dual of the Lie algebra, which we'll call A, such that the pullback of the holomorphic volume form under a group element uh, x of x, x is some Lie algebra element and x of x is therefore some group element. The pullback of the holomorphic volume form under this group element is the holomorphic volume form but multiplied by some unit complex number. Uh, and that unit complex number is given by e to the i a of x. So in other words, it is not necessarily the case that the holomorphic volume form is preserved by the group action if our, if our action is just Kähler, um, but there is some formula for it uh, given by this particular uh, Lie co-algebra element A. And the reason this is important for us is that this A tells us how a Lagrangian mean curvature flow migrates through the level sets of the moment map. So here's the proposition. Uh, we have this A from lemma 3.17, and we have a smoothly immersed G invariant graded Lagrangian, graded meaning that there's a Lagrangian angle for the Lagrangian, um, which we'll call theta, and mean curvature vector H. So therefore L has to exist within some level set of the moment map by the theory that we've talked about today for some uh, xi in the dual of the Lie algebra. Then, d mu of the mean curvature vector is minus a. And what this means is that the mean curvature vector will change the moment map by a. So by integrating this, you can quickly see that uh, if we have some mean curvature flow, ft, that starts at l0, then lt is going to be in the level set xi minus at. 
So the answer in general is no. If we have some Hamiltonian Kähler action on a Calabi Yau manifold, then the Lagrangian mean curvature flow does not preserve the level set. Although it's quite nice that we do know exactly where the Lagrangian will be after time t. We do at least uh, have that certainty. For us, in this work, we're going to focus on the case where a equals zero. Um, because in that case, we have that the level set of the moment map does not change under Lagrangian mean curvature flow, and so we can study Lagrangian mean curvature flow via the Kähler quotient. In this case, we say that G is a Calabi Yau action. Right, um, I think that should be enough for this lecture. Uh, we've finished all the preliminaries now, fortunately, so we can move on to the um, new results of myself and Jesse. Um, we will be focusing on the cohomogeneity one case, which is the case, as I alluded to up here, where our g orbits are n minus one dimensional and so our quotient is two dimensional. So this is the, in a sense, the most basic case uh, where we can apply this, this theory to the study of Lagrangian mean curvature flow. And we're going to focus on the calabi yau action case so that we can employ the Kähler quotient. So see you there, and thanks for listening again.